In 1998, William Mugore, a young Simit-trained plant pathologist working in Uganda, discovered something extraordinary. In his yellow rust screening nursery, he found new virulent races of wheat stem rust that overcame known resistance genes in the wheat lines provided by Simit. This event would become known as the first incidence of what is now called UG99 stem rust. Since its discovery in 1998, the fungal disease has infected wheat plants all the way from South Africa to Yemen and Iran, and evolved into an entire group of stem rust races. The work of William Mugore and his colleagues sparked an unprecedented international response. Today, researchers working for the Borla Global Rust Initiative and the Durable Rust Resistance in Wheat Project are working to mitigate the threat posed to the world's wheat crop by these fungal diseases of wheat. The lives of millions of people in wheat-dependent regions across the world depend on it. My name is William Wagoire. I'm a Ugandan. I work for the National Agricultural Research Organization and currently I'm a director of research of one of the national institutes. My business with the durable rust resistance group is first of all this group comes a long way from work that I did way back in 1998 when I first sounded the alarm for the incidence of what's now called UG99. I had been at Simit working with the Ravi Singh. I hand carried about two boxes of elite lines from his material, counting to up probably 600 different lines for going to test in the field in Uganda. Uh, these materials were known to be for testing resistance for yellow rust. And prior to selecting them, we had been in the field together and we had noticed they, they are good plant types and they are good resistance to yellow rust because at that time nobody was talking of stem rust. So when I got home, I planted out these materials in the field in a place called Kalenjere in southwestern Uganda, about 2,200 meters above sea level as a screening nursery to identify potential high yielding varieties but with resistance to yellow rust because this spot was well known for high incidence of yellow rust. Now during the course of the season I was surprised to note that most of the lines being evaluated had succumbed to stem rust. And this was very unusual because we associate stem rust with lower altitude areas and thus high te higher temperatures, not at this high altitude area which has relatively very cool temperatures, which is uh, uh, conducive environment for yellow rust. And I wrote mail to Ravi and uh, asked him, did we pack the different materials or what? Because I am seeing stem rust in the field. Where well, this is meant to be another different nursery from the one we are thinking. I said no. You and I packed this material and we knew it was for yellow rust testing. Says, William, go back to the field and have a second look. Because maybe you were in a hurry, you didn't see. I said, no, Ravi. These are very many years, since 1980 up to 1998, these are very many years of working with rust. And we have worked together in the summit on a number of occasions. We have been together on traveling workshops in East African region. I definitely know what stem rust is all about. 
this is timorous. He says, fine, but for my sake, go back once more. I said, fine. In two weeks, I sent him another mail. I said, Ravi, it is now over 90% of the lines with over 60 S stem rust. I said, what? I said, yes. Less than 30% are showing relative resistance to stem rust. But everything at this time is stem rust. So he said he was going to send Tom Payne, who was then the cement scientist best in Ethiopia for the East African region, to see for himself too. So Tom Payne came down to Uganda, took him to the field, and of course, as he said himself, he wasn't doubting me, but he confirmed that uh, the situation was that. So he immediately contacted the Ravi, and uh, the advice was quickly pick samples before the materials dry out, and we send them to some laboratories where uh, we can get the material analyzed because these materials have resistance to known genes, known virulence to stem rust. So Tom Payne went back, he sent me some money. I picked samples, gave me the address of Professor Pretorius in South Africa. I dispatched those materials to South Africa to Zach Pretorius. The result is UG99, meaning that the resistance for stem rust, which was conferred by SR31, had been overcome by the disease organisms, so to say, the pathotypes of the stem rust in this area had overcome the strength the resistance conferred by SR31. It's like we're in this room and we see fire coming up from each of these corners. So we start scrambling around to see what to do. I think this is the way I can put it because everybody was now not on alert but was moved to see what to do to combat this threat. Uh, very soon, soon after we published the work, after Zach had uh, conclusively found out that this was a SR31 succumbing to a new pathotype of stem rust. And my director general says, William, what did you do? You are the wit person in this country. What is it that you did? Then the local newspapers picked that story from Simit mm -hmm. and brought up a new disease in Uganda to wipe out all the wheat in the world. So everybody was saying, but who is this person who created this problem? So I humbly explained that uh, this is not a creation by me, but this is a creation in the environment. The disease has been existing, but not to levels that were as worrying as we are now talking. So I made a write-up for my director general to respond to the Minister of Agriculture to saturate all embassies in the country as to why the situation is being labeled the way it is in the newspapers. We did not create the disease. We just happened to be fast enough to notice the disease and report immediately to relevant partners. That led to convening a meeting by Norman meeting was convened in Nairobi in 2005 and the rest is now history because now we have the DRRW in place 
when a crop like wheat gets infected all the way from East Africa through to Asia and we are talking about wheat which is I think the number one cereal worldwide and knowing that especially on the Asian continent the main food is wheat we are talking about a catastrophe people will not have anything to eat they may ship wheat from the Americas it will not be able to be adequate to replace destroyed wheat say on the Asian continent it will have to be more in food relief donations which are not sustainable if you go to Eastern Africa a country like Ethiopia is the largest wheat producer Kenya produces a lot of wheat in Uganda we produce very little wheat but we import a lot of wheat and we eat wheat on a daily basis especially in the urban areas wheat is wheat intake is on a daily basis breakfast snacks and what have you uh, wheat is part of uh, many people's diet now mm -hmm. so destruction of this crop could spell doom for the world at large in terms of hunger in terms of incomes to the farmers that have been growing this crop so it is a, it's a gloomy picture thank god that DRRW and others have taken up taken the issue up without hesitation and I think with the assembled team of scientists and willing donors I think uh, we're in a better shape now I think.